You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza, right here on L.A. Talk Radio. Greetings to all of you listening around the world, and a warm welcome as we bring you another edition of the Answers for the Family radio show. I'm your host, Alan Cardoza, and if you're a regular listener, thank you for joining us once again. If this is your first time, please make yourself at home as we bring you Answers for the Family. Each week, this show will address issues such as locating a runaway teen, family crisis intervention, building self-esteem, dealing with addictions, and so much more. Now, having over 30 years experience working with families in crisis, I've been fortunate to meet and work with some of the top professionals in many of the helping fields and skilled authors who are all working to make this world a better place. And I'm thrilled to have as my guest co-host, Dr. Paul Puri. Paul is a psychiatrist, TV writer, and chief medical officer for Udify, a social enhancement network focused on destigmatizing mental health. And he practices in Los Angeles and teaches psychotherapy to UCLA psychiatry residents. Paul, thanks for joining me here on Answers for the Family. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Well, now, I love the idea of... of of destigmatizing mental health because obviously it's something that you know my company has dealt with for many years yeah. and um, and anytime we can add communication to something it's a positive so yeah. share a little bit about how Udify how the Udify app works and how it really helps yeah uh, Udify is um, both a website and an app. Um, the website has sort of a social media or social, what we call social enhancement platform, which is uh, creating a community of people focused around mental health and trying to connect them where people can ask questions uh, to experts, can support each other, as well as providers, therapists, and so on can support each other, which so it sort of uh, works from both sides. The app uh, offers kind of a, a teletherapy option but the uh, ability to have kind of a matchmaking and speed dating with a therapist. So you enter your information, it'll find you the best fit, and uh, essentially connect you to someone who, it can be anywhere from a therapist to even a mentor or life coach, because not everybody necessarily needs a full therapy. They might just be focusing on wellness. So uh, a kind of a, a versatile uh, range of options for what people need, but lowering the bar to, um, to access for people. So it's not, you don't have to go out and shop around for somebody. You, we can help connect them to you, and you don't have to necessarily leave your house. We'll, we'll make it as easy as possible. And, and from the standpoint of a cost for this, how is that set up? Is that something they're working out with each individual person? Yeah, they're working it right now. Um, I mean, the, the app itself is just in beta right now. What we call the fabric, the social enhancement piece, the website is, um, is free to sign mm-hmm. up for. And so people can join and, and engage with that and ask questions or offer their own opinions and support. The app is going to um, primarily be a little bit of a percentage fee to the providers. So the providers mm-hmm. charge their regular fee, and then the app charges a small percentage for using essentially the, the we call HIPAA-compliant um, teleconferencing, video, audio, HIPAA-compliant texting, all of that's uh, wrapped into it. Well, that sounds great, and it sounds like it's something that could be beneficial even in like the situation with our guest. You Absolutely. Know, you know, with, with a parent who's looking for answers. Mm-hmm. And this can be a way to look for it. Yeah, a lot of times people just feel like they're in isolation and they don't know quite where to turn. So we're trying to offer a unified uh, location for people to, to get services and help and connection. I love it. Well, good. Well, let's bring our guest on. And for for those that um, uh, that have gotten the information ahead of time, so uh, I just want to share that we send out... Uh, an email that goes out to anybody that subscribes to our site. So if you want to know what's going on on a particular show and you want to get prepared for a particular show to listen to it, go ahead and subscribe to AnswersForTheFamily.com and uh, we will send you the information ahead of time. So our topic today is, it's one mother's experience raising a child who was born with multiple disabilities, including cerebral palsy and autism. And I want everybody to know it is truly a compelling story. Mm-hmm. Our, our guest, Eliza Factor, is the founder and president of the Board of Extreme Kids and Crew, a nonprofit community center that connects families with children with disabilities through the arts, music, and play in Brooklyn. She was named New Yorker of the Week by NY1 in 2012 for cr- creating the city's first drop in century play space for children with disabilities. Now, Eliza is also the author of Strange Beauty, A Portrait of My Son, which is a memoir of her experience as a mother to her nonverbal son, Felix. 
In her book, she describes for readers her pregnancy and the few months of bliss, blissful months with Felix before the awareness that something was not as it should be. Sharing the slow realization after many months of grueling and disheartening testing that their son's life and their own would not be at all as they had thought it was imagined to be. Now, listening to her today and reading Strange Beauty will forever change how we view those with physical challenges and the families that love them. Eliza, welcome to Answers for the Family. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Well, I not only appreciate you coming on the show, but uh, writing the book to get information out to families that I think are really just struggling with what to do. And I know one of the things that my company does is we've worked with families of autistic children. And when we meet with the parents, one of the first things that they all tend to say is, I had no idea what to do, where to start, or or how to to deal with the issues that they were dealing with. So I think you putting a book out that explains this, I think, is going to help a lot of people. So thank you for that. Sure. <laughs> I mean, everybody's path is really different. Um, so I, I think part of the main reason I put that out is to cut down on that feeling of isolation that you're alone um, because right. cause you're not alone. Right. So it, what you're saying is, so that was your inspiration as far as writing the book was, how can you keep other people from going through what you went through? Well, I, I honestly think that isolation and con- those feelings of isolation and connection are feelings we all pass through at different points of our life, and we're, we kind of cycle between them. Um, so I don't know if it's possible to avoid feelings of isolation um, if you're just living <laughs> a full and and uh, uh, you know an unpredictable life. But um, but that's not a place you want to stay at. Um, and I feel like when you're there, when you, if you can read a book like that or meet another family, or then then you, you get yanked back into connectivity, um, and that's useful. Yeah, it seems like uh, stories and narrative are a terrific way of connecting people when they when they feel uh, isolated. They can understand where someone else is going through and help them to to understand your journey and hopefully feel less alone in their own way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I felt that even before, I mean, I remember when I was a teenager, it was reading stories that, you know, saved my life because I felt very isolated as a teenager, but like getting into a, a, a really honest book and really, you know, like getting into somebody else's mind was like reminded me that I, I could travel outside of myself and, um, and be connected. So I, I find books quite magical that way now what came first in other words did you always intend for this to be a book or was did the place space come first and then you wrote the book or did the did the book come first and then play space came out of that i uh, know i the I, I i the definitely the play space um i mean before i had felix i was primarily a writer and I, I wrote a couple novels, and so that my life before Felix was very much about language. Um, and then Felix came along, and, and he was nonverbal. Mm. And so one of the things I found uh, really amazing about living with him was how transformational it was to my understanding of communication. I mean, so much of how we communicate is outside of words and I mean but I hadn't been so aware of that when I was a writer and all of a sudden I was having these very deep fascinating um I mean conversations isn't the word but communications with with Felix um and he was kind of revolutionizing the way that I saw the world in in a in a really good way really opening it up um so I always kind of wanted to write about the paradox of of feeling like I have a richer understanding of language through living with somebody who doesn't use language. Um, but it was absolutely impossible to, to write a book when Felix was living with us. He, he was living with us for the first 10 and a half years of his life. And during that time, um, you know, we were just up. <laughs> All the time. Like, I, I, I mean, he slept maybe three or four hours a night 
but not all at once. So like one of us was always with him at night. And then there was also a baby and a toddler. So it, it, I mean, like we just, there was no time, um, for writing. Uh, and, and reflect, he, it seems like. as you see in strange beauty, I mean, there was a lot of hospitalizations and, and interventions and stuff like that. So, um, I couldn't, I couldn't write because for me, writing means like two, at least two hours a day of time to focus. Mm -hmm. And when he was home, it was more like maybe you'd get 10 minutes here or five minutes here. But that's enough time to start a play space. I mean, that's enough time to get people together and get that kind of community momentum happening. So, so I, so when Felix was home, that's when we started Extreme Kids. And that was incredibly um, powerful um, and wonderful for our whole family. And then Felix kind of miraculously, we got him into this incredible school up in New Hampshire um, when he was 10 and a half. And it was a wonderful thing for him because he'd really been in a really, really dark space here in, in Brooklyn. And his, uh, we just we were struggling so much we couldn't help him um, and then he got into this school and, and really blossomed and um, and it, it was great but I, I, I just missed him terribly and the house seemed so empty without him so that I, I wrote the book I think for so many reasons but one I just had to I mean I had to write the book because he wasn't here every day and it life without him as hard as it had been was so full and when he was gone it became a lot emptier and so the book filled some of that up um the other thing i really wanted to do in that book there, there's two other things i wanted to show how full and complex a personality um felix has because a lot of people who see him think oh he's a beautiful angel or oh he's he's like an empty shell. Um, but he's just, he's just a very charismatic, enormous person. Um, he just doesn't use language and he can't move like we do. Um, and so I wanted to illustrate that just because there, you know, there's such condescension towards people who don't use language and don't fit into the boxes. Um, and then the other thing is that the Felix's dark periods translated in, into really intense violence towards himself, hmm. um, which meant our whole house was kind of consumed with violence because like either Jason or I would have to be physically struggling with him so that he wouldn't really harm himself. So he could have blinded himself. He could have done worse uh, if he w didn't have the physical disabilities he had. Um, but, you know, there would be times where he'd have, it was like boxing, like, you know, like bouts of boxing every few hours for 72, 72 hours. So you'd be so exhausted and so fried at the end of it. And, you know, there's, I, there's times I just, I honestly don't know how we escaped unscathed from some of those moments. I, I'm very aware that it was, it was how lucky we were. Um, and how much we needed help and how little there is for, for families who are undergoing really extreme, dangerous violence um, mm -hmm. on the part of their children. Uh, and, you know, we don't want to send our children to jail. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, it's not their fault necessarily. It's, you know, and, but, but, you know, you, there's so many families, I know that there's so many families that are kind of dealing with the same kind of stuff and we don't talk about it because we're afraid of really confronting violence. And I, so I wanted to put that out there, uh, hoping to, you know, spark some conversation and, and understanding for, for these families caught in these cycles. Well, your book has definitely done that. Now, in the book, you describe many, many rounds of, of testing to diagnose Felix what what eventually became his actual diagnosis? <laughs> well, I mean, there there is as many diagnoses as there are doctors <laughs> with different viewpoints. Uh, I, I, physically, you can 
kind of go straight to the source, which is the periventricular leukomalacia that was diagnosed when he was um, one. Uh, he has, that means he has a, uh, he, he lost a lot of the white matter in his brain when he was in utero, probably because of the chicken pox. I had the chicken pox um, during the second trimester of my pregnancy with him. And, and after that, a very complicated pregnancy and a difficult um, delivery. I so there was all kinds of Eliza, for one physical second, brain damage that happened to him for those that don't know, at that time. The white matter and, problems are the and connections so from, between yeah, the brain. Sorry, yeah. I, I didn't catch that what? Oh, just that the white matter, white matter lesions are, the white matter is the connection between the brain cells, uh, just to, for those that might not know that. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and, and, you know, and these cells don't, you can't, they, they don't really grow back. And so, I mean, you can do all kinds of therapy and, and, and Felix is learning and he can do um, things he couldn't do when he was younger and, and, and he's has a, a enormous appreciation of life and he's very charismatic so he's he he can do all sorts of things but um but there's you know he he definitely has physical limitations he's, he can't walk he he can't dress himself he can't um speak uh although i shouldn't say he can't speak at all cuz he has like words that he'll say um like he'll chew the word or a phrase that he'll say for like six months and then it will change. And, and, and his words and phrases can be quite wonderful. Um, but he doesn't use language in a way that, you know, you do in school or, or in conversation in the neighborhood. Um, anyway, so the diagnoses like autism and cerebral palsy are really useful. Uh, they're kind of grab bags of, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that are put into these diagnoses and that you want these, di these more common diagnoses because it's easier to get services. Um, so, I mean, I learned over time that diagnoses are really just uh, like pathways to services and medicines and, and they, you know, they can, they'll shift over time as, as, you know, either a Felix's condition shifts or somebody, some doctor sees him through a different angle. Mm -hmm. uh, to speak to <clears throat> to speak to that as a psychiatrist, a lot of times it's just based on the information you have, and and very often what you see in the room is a snapshot, and so it's it's it varies from moment to moment. I'm sure um, how he how he appeared to people could vary the diagnosis, but um, most probably uh, didn't change the the level of uh, treatment that you were seeking. In terms of you needed what you needed at that moment, regardless of what the name was for what he was going through. Exactly, exactly. Now, let's let's talk a little bit about as far as your family life. So you mentioned that you you had additional children after Felix. Was there yeah. doubt? Was there doubts at some time? You know, you know, with with everything all, that's so encompassing of of having Felix. Were there doubts of should we have more children? Um, you know, this this had to be something really weighing on you and your husband. Yeah, um, yeah. I must say, I I am very grateful to our pediatrician, Doctor Pitlack, who who plays quite a role in this book. She, we were just so lucky to have such a great, down to earth grandma um, of a pediatrician. But uh, I was utterly consumed with helping Felix for the first couple of years of his life and was not thinking about having kids at all. Um, but I remember when we got the MRI um, that showed that he had PBL, which, and, and I was devastated by this because I had still been hoping that he might kind of kind of veer back into a, a more typical body and mind just, you know, as he got older, we could help him, um, you know, get control over his body. Uh, but the neurologist said, you know, he has periventricular leukomalacia, uh, it's moderate to severe, he's going to be moderately to severely disabled throughout his life. Um, there's nothing you can do. I mean, that's basically what he said. And I went to see my pediatrician the next day and I was like, oh, did you talk to Dr. 
Wells. And um, she said, yes, with this big smile. And I said, did he tell you? And she's like, yes, isn't it great news? <laughs> and I was just like, what? <laughs> but I mean, she she meant like, A, we had been worried he might have a degenerative disease, which would have been terrible. Um, and B, it, she, from her point of view, it, I mean, it wasn't genetic. And so she could encourage me to have more children. Yes. And um, I just, I was so, uh, I was so kind of charmed by how unprofessional her response was. I mean, like, you know, she's like, have more babies. But uh, at the time, I just was like, that's a funny story. But of course, her words stuck with me. And, uh, and I didn't really get such a strong push from our family. I think they were worried about us. We were older, and, and Felix was a lot of work. And, um, and Jason, but, but Jason and I both came from two kid uh, homes, and, and we'd been planning on having two kids before. And so... I think that Edna really kind of helped push us in that direction. And then once we had Miranda, all sorts of older people started coming up to me and saying, have another. And it turns out they all had been from families with uh, and had a, had a disabled sibling and had other siblings who weren't disabled. And they just said it was so great. I mean, like it's, that these families are wonderful to grow up in, but they were really, really, really um, grateful for their non-disabled sibling because there's just, you know, it's a really different dynamic than, um, you know, most of the families on the block. And so you have this other sibling that really gets it. And, you know, I was like listening to these passionate people, knowing that they were coming from um, a very good space, but also knowing that, it was, you know, like there's no guarantee that we're not going to have, uh, you know, kids with, I mean, you know, another kid with major disabilities, and then Miranda would be like the only one that wasn't. Um, but I think the fact is that Felix, I was, I, 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 Felix was such a great kid and had such a um, great appreciation of life and had taught me so much. The idea of having another kid with disabilities wasn't, I mean, it, it, I think before I had Felix, I thought that that would be such a hard life to give someone. But then having Felix, I realized, oh, it's, 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 I mean, it's hard, but lots of the best things in life are hard. And, and he, you know, like, it's worth it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I think it was both the example of Felix um, making me realize that this thing that we all think is so bad isn't actually that bad. Uh, and then all of these other these other uh, siblings of people with disabilities coming out of the woodwork and telling me to have more kids. So and I like... actually am I'm not someone that usually listens to advice. So the fact that I was listening means there must have been something in me that uh, agreed with them. <laughs> so it sounds like uh, having Felix in this way helped you to form a community within the within you know your immediate area in Brooklyn, as well as starting to develop your family as part of that. Could you could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. Um, well, it was actually having having Miranda and then Happy. I think when I guess we had Miranda came when Felix was about three and a half, and then Happy came two years later. And they, we, I got them into this really wonderful neighborhood cooperative preschool that um, had a, you know there's a lot of parent involvement. There's a lot of uh, like family get-togethers around this preschool, and it was so fun. And I met all of these people and. Um, realized that when Felix had been that age, I had only been talking with doctors and therapists, and I didn't have time really for anything else. But and what I tried, I, I like the conversations with other parents just didn't work because I was in a really different environment than they were, and I had really different concerns about Felix than they had about their kids. But when I had Miranda and Happy, all of a sudden I could click with all of these neighborhood parents and take part in these picnics and it was really fun and I felt embraced um, whereas I had felt pretty much like going off onto like an island of our own when we had Felix and the um, the structure of this uh, this preschool the way I was like 
on the community events committee and the way we like structured these events was so it was simple and and laid back and cheap and I was like we could I could do this would be so great to like do this for families who had kids with disabilities and um you know we don't wouldn't have to start a school because that's just like beyond my capabilities but but all of the fun things around the schools, the picnics and the, you know, the the field trips and the movie nights and the art projects, we could do that. Um, so I really took the kind of experience of having neurotypical kids and tried to put that, you know, kind of create a program that would replicate that for family, you know, not just for the kids with disabilities, but their whole family to, so that families would, would meet each other and, um, and, and that was free because, uh, you know, there's a lot of services in New York, but mm, most of them are quite, they're, they're beyond reach um, for most people. And I really wanted to use disability as a way to bring people, uh, you know, together across class and race. And um, it, it just took off like mad. I mean, we started in 2011 and now it's 2017. We have... Uh, play spaces in Queens and Brooklyn. We're opening one in the Bronx, and we, you know, have thousands of families that have taken part. And there, there was just there was such a need um, that it just kind of blossomed quite easily and beautifully. Well, I, I want everybody to know. First of all, I, I think that that's wonderful. And if you've ever been around something like that, and there is something similar here in Los Angeles, and I remember when my children were small. Uh, and I was invited to go to, it was the equivalent to a play space, but it was put on by the regional center, and it was a daytime Halloween party. And so I took, uh, you know, I took my kids at the time, were maybe five and eight, and so they were dressed up and ready to go. Well, so was everybody else, and they, they had this big picnic at Griffith Park, and everybody was running around, and, and after a while, you realize that nobody felt that anybody was any different. It was such a beautiful experience that I remember afterwards saying that I really believe that it would be great to have those type of parties in, you know, at some of the public schools for all of the kids, and it, mm -hmm. because, you know, my kids came away with such a great um, feeling of of play and and unity with everybody that was there. So again, I, yeah. I I just really commend you for putting something like that together because it helps all of us. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it sure helped me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So for everybody out there listening, we are going to take a break. We our our topic today is uh, one woman's experience raising a child who was born with multiple disabilities. Uh, stay with us. We're going to be right back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Founded over 30 years ago to meet the needs of families in crisis, Westfield has continually focused on resolving issues that negatively impact families and businesses. Our signature therapeutic transportation service helps to ensure that adolescents in crisis are safely transported to specialized schools, programs, and treatment centers with unsurpassed experience and success. We are supported by our full-service licensed investigation agency that has legally, professionally, and compassionately located hundreds of runaways and teens. We are experienced and qualified to help, offering solutions which may include referrals to our international network of top professionals in the fields of educational consulting, psychology, psychiatry, and investigations. Simply put, Westfield Adolescent Services and West Shield Investigations are the best solutions when your family is facing a personal crisis. Call 1-800-899-8585, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. That's 1-800-899-8585, or visit our website at westshield.com. Thank you. And we're back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. Here. There we go. We're back. You're listening to Answers for the Family. And uh, we are talking about um, in literally a, a mother's experience of raising a child, but more than just that, you know, what we can do to then take it to the community, what we can do to help others. And uh, anyway, and so she now has a book out. The book is called Strange Beauty, A Portrait of My Son. Now, we have some listener questions that have come in, and uh, there's one here that's, that reads, 
Um, I read a CDC re- report last year that stated that one in every 68 children suffer from some degree of autism or similar condition. Recently, my brother was informed that his 18-year-old son, 18-month-old son, has autism. And, um, you know, uh, as devastating as this news has been, he and his wife uh, are full of hope and have decided to start the process with nutrition changes and other alternative therapies. Do you have any experiences with such options or anything you can recommend to them? And this is from uh, Alexander in Michigan. Um, I do have experience um, with alternative uh, therapies. In fact, Felix um, responded very well to acupressure um, when he was going through some really hard times. Um, and we, we, we did all kinds of interesting diets, too. Um, it sounds to me like your brother and his wife, I think that was right, are, are yeah. totally on the right track. I mean, a diagnosis of autism in my world, really, it, it's not bad news. It's... it's um, it just means your life is going to be unpredictable, <laughs> mm-hmm. and and it may be filled with great joy and 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 discovery. I mean, I mean, so many amazing people have autism, and it really is a very it's such a broad um, diagnosis that it, it 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 there's no one thing it means. It just means that your brain is wired a little differently, and that you. Um, you ha- your uh, some of your social skills um, aren't intuitive. They have to be learned from the outside. Um, it, it can. I mean, some some diagnoses of autism can be devastating. I'm not saying it's always a great thing, but but it also you know it, it's 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 not determinative. The um, and I I must say that like the the kids I know with autism, and I know hundreds. Um, I I try not to say this in front of my daughters, but I enjoy being with them a little bit more than the neurotypical kids, just because they're so free and um, and they're not overly involved with status and where they are, you know, in the social world, and they're not trying to impress you. They're just they really they really get interested in things, and they have this passion. Um, that, that's what makes. Um, a lot of people with autism go into the sciences and arts. It, it's it's it, it's not. It just means that life is going to be a little bit harder, but it's not a terrible. It's not a terrible thing at all. And and to go into it with hope and imagination and flexibility, um, is great. I mean that, that that's that's what I just, that's what yeah. you need is hope and imagination and flexibility and a sense of humor, and um, and help and you know that, to always to always be looking for community and help um, and, and other families who have kids with autism. Uh, Eliza, now what, what I hear you saying is, is that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds like what you're saying is there's a lot of authenticity there. And, and, and yeah, I, and I mean, I, the autistic world is really, it's, yeah. it's, it's like, a, it's to me, I feel freer um, than when I'm going someplace that's, that, you know, is, is, is Kind of normalized. Well, I want to ask Paul. So, as a psychiatrist, um, what would be some of the reasons why somebody that's you know that's affected with autism might become just more authentic than many of the rest of us? Well, I think uh, um, some people, you know, autism is a spectrum, the an autism mm-hmm. spectrum disorder, and it and there's a wide range, as Eliza was saying, and so some people might have um, more sort of sensitivities and difficulty um, with that sort of inhibiting themselves or controlling themselves, and so you might just get a a clearer lens as to what a person is thinking or feeling. There's less for lack of a better term at this moment, duplicity there that you, you know they they wear their heart on their sleeves a lot of the time mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and uh, it was described to me one time in working with one as having no filter. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> but that could be a beautiful yeah. thing. Absolutely, and, and, yeah. And, you know, it, it can cause some challenges in the social world, but it can be a beautiful thing to be able to, to see that person exactly for, for who they are right there. Yeah, in fact, I, I have a friend uh, who actually is in New York, and he's a playwright. And uh, I sent a script to him one time. 
and asked him for his opinion. And he gave me his opinion. And uh, it was very blunt. There was no filter. <laughs> and, but, but yet at the same time, I told him, I mean, it's exactly why I sent it to him. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, there, there are friends that I know will read something and they really like me and they don't want to hurt my feelings. So they just go, oh, yeah, that's nice. I needed somebody to tell me exactly what they thought. And he told me exactly what he thought and exactly what, he ne what it needed to be what he felt would be anywhere close to good. So, um, so yes, yeah. I, what I'm saying is, is I agree. I think it's it's a beautiful thing when you have someone that is going to be so uh, direct and so authentic with um, whatever it is that you're talking about. Uh, Eliza, I wanted to read a different listener question. Um, yeah. I purchased your, let's see, I purchased your book and could not put it down. As a parent of a teen with serious bipolar issues, I was truly moved by your journey that mirrors so many of us. You were so correct in how powerful it is to create community with other parents of disabled and impaired children. In great gratitude, Carolyn, North Carolina. Uh, it doesn't yeah. exactly have a question, but in there, I guess I'm I'm wondering um, what the range is of of different um, children and families with disabilities that you have found connection to in your area. Uh, well, first, I just wanted to to thank Carolyn. Oh, that makes uh, other parents' um, comments are always like, you know, it, they fuel us, right? So mm -hmm. thank you. Um, the idea behind uh, Extreme Kids was really to open as wide a net as possible. Um, I think partly it's because Felix has so many disabilities that like he could never fit into any of the programs. There was just, you know, there are a lot of things that are just for kids with autism, or just for kids with physical disabilities, and none of that really worked for him. But I identified with all of them, and, and I, uh, and I identify inherently with difference um, just because I'm a artist and I was a weird kid at school. So I wanted to, to um, have a place that would just, where anyone could come and they wouldn't have to explain themselves. And, and if they were doing something that looked weird, it would be okay. So it, it's really for everyone. That said, the, sp the physical spaces we've been able to create seem to work best for kids that are like, say, eight to nine or ten most of them are um, able-bodied. ADHD and autism are the main, the main um, diagnoses because we have like these sensory gyms and they just love that kind of movement. Um, but we, we do get kids, um, you know, we, we, see, we get other kids too, but that's kind of the, the heart of the, the people that come back all the time are, are these kids um, who can, you know, who want to be swinging all day long um or yeah i mean i, I would say that was the the most people get my my dream is eventually to get that billionaire who's going to be listening to this who's going to give me the money to create a really big building that would um have all these different kinds of environments that so that we could get more uh, we could kind of create a, a ideal environment that would embrace more you know people of different ages and more more disabilities um and that would have like areas for showing off what we do, you know, like kind of a cultural center. Um, okay, but that's, uh, yeah, <laughs> that's well, not happening anytime well, right now. <laughs> well, let's, let's not, let's not put that part of it out there. Okay. So, <laughs> so for, for that billionaire or anybody else out there listening that would like more information, how can they get in touch with you? Uh, well, we have um, a website that, that, shows off all we do and actually on it is a free um do it yourself toolkit if you're interested in trying to start something like this in your community um it's just go to extreme kids and org, and um it's in the about section that's where the toolkit is um it's basically a chapter from my book that talks about the process of starting it along with a kind of nitty gritty um, breakdown of, of, you know, insurance stuff and logistical stuff and the equipment stuff and, and money, you know, like just like how much things cost. Um, 
so that you'd have a, a sense of, of uh, you know, how, how you might start something like that. All right. So that's the marching orders for everybody out there that's listening. So <laughs> you, you either contact a uh, billionaire that you know and uh, give them that information, or if you want to set up something like this in your community, uh, go to the website. Now, if you're driving out there and you couldn't write that website down, uh, if you go to the AnswersForTheFamily.com website, we will have all of that information waiting there for you. So everybody now has their marching orders. The, the, this is your weekly duty. So, <laughs> so now one of the things in, in the book, I mean, you, you're very forthright about the fact that your financial situation, you know, meant that you could give Felix what he needed. Well, we realize that not everybody is in that position. You know, you know, do you think about, um, you know, what it would have been like, you know, having Felix if you were not, uh, in, oh, in, that, time. in that same situation? All the time. I mean, be- before I was, um married i was a waitress at a you know not fancy place for you know a dozen years and so i mean it was i had i i got by but like the idea of trying to get by on that salary with a kid like felix um you know, we, I mean, we, I, we definitely would have gone on disability and, and gotten food stamps and stuff like that. And, and I've met lots of um, mothers, um, you know, who, who really are in that, in that position through extreme kids. Um, and so, I mean, I do kind of, I think, I think from knowing all of these great mothers, um, I think I, I, I like I can see how I could have done that, but I wouldn't have been able to start a community center. Um, it, it's inter- I find it really interesting. The other thing is that Jason and I actually don't have enough money to really care for Felix as he needs to be cared for. I mean, it's interesting. We have enough money that I don't have to bring in a salary and can, but and and we can pay for like a babysitter. But what he needs is 24-hour care and X amount of hours of therapy. And, I mean, he needs just so much help. Even we can't do that. Um, so the, the point is that at that level of disability, it really needs to be a, a – the communities really need to come together to support each other, I mean, unless you're like Bill Gates, I mean, the, the billionaire again. But, like, it's, it's beyond um, – the reach of, of, you know, almost anybody. Um, and anyway, then the other thing I wanted to say about money is that there's this, that's, I've, there's this paradoxical thing I've noticed with some of the parents that come in to extreme kids and even parents I meet just in the neighborhood is that some people with a lot of money, throw money at problems, and um, and there's this kind of this feeling that you know you can get out of it with money, and and so when you have a kid who who's going to be disabled, like they you know like doesn't matter how much therapy, and the, they ha- they can be a little bit um, more terrified than than people who are used to struggling and used to life being a little bit like. Difficult. I mean, you know, I mean, like, in some ways, I've seen a more kind of harmful behavior from some of my wealthier um, mother friends than from some of the, the mothers from the projects and stuff. And it's it's interesting. I think it's. I mean, money is money is tricky. It's it's it makes things possible, but it can also warp things. Yeah, I think, <clears throat> you know, to, just to, to take a, diff- a slightly different tack on, I used to do work with, um, I do work with different communities, and I used to do work with the homeless, and then I have, like, a, um, a private practice. And people would often think that doing therapy with people, you know, who can afford to go to see a psychiatrist for therapy would think, like, well, what kind of problems can they actually have? And interestingly, my work with the homeless very much was the same. Everybody seems to have the same groups of problems and money doesn't really 
the only difference is that for me, the the people that I was seeing, the homeless didn't have money as on their list of problems, or the people with money didn't. <laughs> the homeless had money yeah. on their list of problems. Everything else is the same, and so it doesn't necessarily change anything in terms of the life struggles. It just um, it's just means you can pay for parking. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like there were some, like some of the, the poorer families had stronger family connections mm -hmm. and, and what you really need when you're, um, when you have a kid with autism and with a lot of, this, but you, what you need is lots of people. You need, you, you need lots of hands on deck because just the physical amount of work is a lot. And one person can't be, you can't do that and make a living and see your other kids and every now and then get some sleep or take a shower. I mean, you just, you need to have a bunch of people helping out. So like f strong, you know, multi-generational families and stuff um, are great for kids with disabilities. And, you know, so, so, you know, there's just different, there's different ways, depending on where you're coming from, you know, you're, you're going to have different resources, but, but, and, and, and obviously it's easier with money and I'm aware of that. Um, but, but it's complicated. Oh, and I th but I think that there's something. There's also something there about certain. There are differences within from family to family, as you talked about uh, neurotypical kids. Not everybody necessarily has the expectation that their children need to become, you know, neurotypical or, or you know, whatever is on sort of a normative uh, a curve of yeah. what we expect to be normal, quote unquote normal. Um, and so I'm, I'm guessing that there are differences there between families. Sometimes those with who have more money or more income have an expectation. If I throw enough resources, then maybe we can get my kid back into uh, some yeah. type of a neurotypical state. And others just say, well, this is, we allow for all kinds of diversity. My cousin has this problem and my uncle has this problem and, and we, we pull together as a family. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. I mean, it's really different per family. You know, what, one of and the per things... kid. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, disability is such a huge... It, it, you know, there's so many different kinds of kids with disabilities. I have a friend who has a kid with Down syndrome, and she just can't stand it when people say, but they're so sweet! <laughs> and she's just like, do they want to come over and see him fighting with his brothers? <laughs> you know? I mean, each, each, each child really is very different. No child is a diagnosis. So, like, how each family deals with this specific child with this specific diagnosis it has a lot to do with that child's personality. Yeah, and I, I imagine that there's one more, you know, it's incredibly um, challenging in a learning experience to both be frustrated at, by your own child and yet still have love for them no matter how frustrating they are. Yeah. Now, uh, uh, Eliza, and time has just flown by. We are just about out of time. But one oh, of no. Wow, that was quick. But I know. But one of the things that you mention in the book is that um, th the many times in which there's that special something that Felix has that makes so many people open up and smile. Um, share with us a few of those things here before we, uh, we have to go. Well... We are thinking, thinking that his future um, job should be to be a laugh track laugher because his laughter is so powerful and funny. Like if if I'm wheeling him down the street, like in New York City, which is a place where people kind of keep to themselves just because there's so many of us, but if Felix starts laughing people like on the other side of crowded avenues will look over and start like waving and laughing also. I mean, it's like, it, it's really infectious. Um, and, and it's not always clear why he's laughing, but clearly something is very funny and, and, and it, he gets total strangers to, to laugh with him. Um, he also just has a really great sense i think of people's i just call it vibe because like he 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 can kind of feel um some deep part of people and he'll just really respond to a lot of people he just completely ignores it's like he doesn't take them in but when he um is interested in the person he'll reach out towards them and he always knows the person to reach out towards because whenever he does that the people just get the most 
enormous smile on their face, and they just seem to feel so um, honored. And, and they come, and they start talking, and they're always lovely people. Uh, and, and I know, you know, he could... He, there's lots of other people that are terrified of him. So it's like he really gets this something about that, like about each individual, and he can see it and um, and draw out um, their beauty, and and they they feel it, and it's it's really just it doesn't happen all the time, but when it does, it's it's just one of those things that kind of stays with you for a long time. Well, Eliza, thank you so much for sharing with us. And I, and I think, as, as Paul would agree, um, laughter is the best form of therapy. So it's, it, it sounds like he's going up and down the streets of New York providing therapy for lots of people. <laughs> I so, think he is. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and uh, please keep us posted. Um, you know, feel free to shoot over some information of anything you'd like to put on our site so that uh, if anybody out there is listening would like to know how Felix is doing. Um, go right ahead. Check it out. That would be great. All Thank right. you so much. You're welcome. I really enjoyed it. All right. And for everybody out there, please tune in next Monday when we will discuss a new book entitled They'll Never Be the Same, A Parent's Guide to PTSD in Youth. And if you get a chance, please go by and visit the archives of our past shows on AnswersForTheFamily.com or better yet, subscribe to our show through iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. And if you like what you hear, please leave a review. It will help us reach more people and we greatly appreciate it. Next time you're on Facebook or Twitter, please remember to stop by our page, check out some of our latest posts. If you like them, please like us and spread the word. Paul, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Alan. You are welcome anytime. Let me know when it fits in your schedule. I'd love to have you back. Sounds great. All right. So for everybody out there, be good human beings and be with us next week on Answers for the Family. You're listening to Answers for the Family with Alan Cardoza right here on L.A. Talk Radio. 